So for this final panel, what we, we typically do at each conference is uh, uh, have some of our, our speakers and our, our special guests visiting us uh, to, to help synthesize the thoughts of, of the conference. And um, also, since we have a couple of experts here on sustainable development goals, as you heard from uh, Amanda Ellis, she was in the room when these were developed at the United Nations, which is really cool. And uh, we have Dr. Del Weber, who has already aligned these goals uh, with his campus uh, in the University of West Indies. Um, and so we want to hear how they did that. And uh, with, with all of our speakers, um, we, we just want to hear about uh, uh, what they thought about um, the theme, sustainable then, sustainable again, and how we can get rid of that question mark to become sustainable again. And any thoughts from, from you, Ms. Moran? I was going to say, not, not just remove the question mark, but maybe even, even uh, temper it a little bit. Um, but we would so uh, be grateful to hear what your, your thoughts are. And it's, I think it's not only for the Center for Island Sustainability, but if there are any connections with, with certainly the, the businesses that are also looking um, to adopt stronger, more aggressive sustainability goals, that would be so helpful. Okay, so we'll give each um, panelist uh, just a couple of minutes uh, for their thoughts. Uh, then we'll have some uh, questions and answers from the audience. And at the end of all this, we have at least three exciting announcements that have come up in the past hour that we're excited to share with everybody. So we'll start off with uh, Master Navigator, Larry Regatel. Um, so, so thank you, Dr. Shelton. Uh, it's been a very exciting time to be with you here in Guam. I really don't have much to say, but uh, the thing that came to mind when Dr. Shelton asked me about 15 minutes ago to be on this panel um, <coughs> is that um, I think many things have been shared in this conference room. Much have been passed on, knowledge, information. Someone said knowledge or information is power. Um, I say that it's more powerful if you use it. In, the, in, the, in navigation or canoe building, we are told and we are taught that whatever we learn uh, is not meaningful if we don't apply it. You can be the greatest navigator, but uh, if you've never uh, sailed a canoe, uh, then it's useless. And so along those same line, I wish that the participants to this conference can actually take something away from here and, and apply it, be a uh, be be more, be a little bit more uh, kind to our planet, to our ocean, to our land. Um, you know, it's someone put it up last night. If you're good to Guam, Guam will be good to you. And I think that statement rings a lot for me too, because uh, you know, talk is cheap. Uh, you you. We are all feeling very good about learning all of this information, and um, but unless we apply them, um, it would be kind of mean meaningless to my good friend, Dr. Shelton here, who's brought us all together. I leave you with um, one final, um, as a seafarer myself and as a person of the ocean, I think this conference has given you all the components, the paddles, the sail, and your canoe. Uh, the ocean and the horizon is, is set and is calling. Uh, it's for you to now put all of that together and sail out the horizon and save the planet. You know, as voyagers, you may not be able to, uh, or change is imminent, it's here. It's coming and it's going to stay. But as voyagers, if you, we know that we cannot control the wind speed and the wind directions, but we can also uh, adjust our sail. 
so that our journey and our voyage continues. Uh, please, uh, I am very honored and very pleased to be here at this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Ms. Amanda Ellis, we enjoyed your keynote presentation this morning and look forward, uh, eager to hear your final thoughts as well. As the sustainability, again, question mark part of the conference, I wanted to particularly thank Master Navigator Larry, given that, as it was just said on the previous panel, this whole renaissance, this understanding that bringing indigenous wisdom learning the systems thinking of the past and then actually applying it has been through the generosity of brilliant people like Master Navigator Larry. And what I would love to see is that boomerang effect that was also referred to on the previous panel, because yes, talk is cheap. So how might we be able to look at the lessons learned from Hawaii, Hawaii Green Growth and the Aloha Plus Challenge, now measuring very carefully against six key goals which crosswalk against all 17 SDGs. So my challenge would be, Guam, you are so well positioned for Guam green growth. And Dr. Shelton, I love your nice framework, natural resources, the uh, IT piece, and then circular economy and environmental sustainability. How might you put some actual goals around that and create your own framework here so that talk isn't cheap, but we can actually see how progress is as we map it each year. So that would be my challenge to seeing how we can actually get rid of that question mark and build on the fantastic work that's going on in Guam, but actually rigorously measure it so that you can compare and share those lessons with the rest of the world. Thank you. Well, I was just in a session where they were talking about uh, uh, trying to, trying to uh, regain uh, traditional healing uh, and that it, it had almost been lost. And, um, you know, uh, we have uh, in New Mexican cultures, uh, we have traditional healers. Now, if you're not part of that tribe or Pueblo or whatever, you don't have access to it. But, but just knowing it exists is very important for the world. Uh, in the morning, uh, Pueblos get up and pray for us uh, before they pray for themselves. And I think it's really important that uh, we not uh, that we see that it's <laughs> fundamentally important to have this kind of knowledge continued on Earth. Um, I'm trying to think of <laughs> my mother. You always, my mother had all these dichos, you know, which is uh, what, do you, what you don't appreciate, you soon lose. And so I think it's very good to have this to think about. Um, but you do have to do something. You know, I get really tired. I hear a lot. And I don't want to like say this to be. Um, bragging or anything but but you know people will talk uh, and they'll say oh we have to you know I, I don't know how we'll have another Maggie or something like that you know and it really I hate to say it but it makes me angry um, because it's uh, it you know we're all just human beings in this boat and and we all need to actually do something and to do that, we have to think more deeply. You can't just take what we've heard at this conference and walk away and expect to um, you know, change the face of Guam, but think more deeply, because each one of you, I mean, I did start with my assumption that everybody has the potential to do something amazing in their lives, but you know, we have no warranty on this life. I mean, any, I couldn't imagine that I've lived this long, but any of us, this could be our last day on earth. And what, no, seriously, you know, I mean, I think the thing is, uh, uh, I've had a lot of people with cancer in my family, and so I tend to remember this whole thing. But, you've, but you, you have to realize that you have today. You have the person sitting next to you. You have the thing that you learned that spoke to your heart. And it's not just walk out the door. It's like, what's your role? in this.
Well, Austin, Jackie, fellow panelists, half a day, right? So I'm here. There's nothing called chance. I'm here because my boss couldn't make it. His loss, and I'm just enjoying this. So I'm amazed at what I've come here and I've found. I had no idea. Never been to the Pacific before. No idea what I was coming to see. I'm blown away by what I have seen. Firstly, you've managed to get in one room academics, legislators, students, private sector, public sector. There's no question mark about again. It's, it's already a done deal, and you're way ahead of many. And I'll tell you, in many ways, you're ahead of the Caribbean. So you are doing the right thing and going the right places. The advice that you've asked me to provide, I can only tell you what we've done at the University of the West Indies. It's working, but I'm not going to say it's a formula that works for everybody. For us, we decided to take on the 17 strategic development goals. We decided to put our research cluster to work from the university. Now, because we're 17 countries, four campuses, we would, for instance, with SDG2, we would say we want to get rid of hunger. So we would get agriculture and food security from all the campuses, two or three colleagues from three or four campuses, and then you get them together, a small amount of seed funds, and you put them to work. They're going to solve one problem. A country needs to shift from sugarcane to something else. What are they going to shift to? Why are they going to shift? What are the, the, the parameters they're going to use? What's the water going to be? Should they go to a ground crop? So the research allows us to connect with each strategic development goal. And that, I think, has worked very well for us. The second thing is that within the Caribbean, I think we realized that we couldn't take on all 17. I mean, the University of the West Indies has not taken on all 17. We've done probably about 12. But that's a lot. Within the Caribbean, the UN decided to compartmentalize and package some of those under various areas. Like, so health and wellness would have a number of strategic development goals involved, which reduced it from 17 to four. We can now engage with all four, and that's something that you may want to think about. Is there a way you could package some of these into grouping? Um, SDG 1, 2, 3, 7, 9, and 14 may take you all on one thematic area a more healthy environment or something like that, then you could work at those as a group. I think also getting all the presidents that you got here to come together and enunciate as they did on, on issues, I think that's another way forward. You've already begun to answer some of those questions, which is why I think the question mark is removed. It's, it is definitely sustainability again. Finally, use your academics to do the best that you can. Publish what you have, because that's how people take notice of you. The University of the West Indies became the lead on climate change because we were publishing constantly and we started the 1.5 to stay alive with data so that the international associations of universities then said, why don't you go get together 10 universities who have an interest in climate change and come back to us with an answer. But it's by publishing that you get recognized. That's how people know you're there. Finally, what you do is already connecting you. Don't feel like you're starting from scratch. You already are doing a lot. You just need to connect the dots. All the work that I've heard of that's been happening at the University of Guam, you just need to say, okay, this already connects to energy. And this one connects to health and wellness. You're already well down the track. You just need to put it into a package so you can recognize it. And I congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Well, I just want to uh, introduce our next speaker since he hasn't been on stage yet, uh, except for the breakout sessions. Uh, uh, my colleague here, Dr. Darren Lerner, the director of the University of Hawaii Sea Grant Program and also director of the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center, our co-sponsors for the event. Thank you, Austin. And don't get too hung up on that last word, center. I hear it's changing again. So um, I'm really humbled, actually, honestly, to be sitting up here with these folks. Um, I, too, uh, like others, uh, got rather short, though a little bit longer notice. This time, anyways, a couple years ago we did this, it was a little shorter. So I did something that Austin didn't want me to do, and I just made a few slides that I hope will come up and show in the background. And if they don't, and, and Austin was working against me, then I'll just talk. So we'll see what happens there. There they are. Um, I, I really, I have, I, I offer to you that I have nothing to say that hasn't been said over the last couple of days. Um, but instead, I share with you 
some of the my take homes and what I go home and back to the University of Hawaii and the programs that we're running and, and bring to the wonderful people that I have the privilege to work with. Um, and it's really just four words. The first one is people. And I, I put up here a couple of images and um, the one on the left, of course, is, uh, is an island and a toll with, with some stuff on it, if you will, but no people. And I guess I wanna just ask the audience, how many people here, if, if a typhoon or a tsunami or whatever, your, your disaster du jour comes through and wipes that out, how many people with a show of hands um, care? Um, wipes out the, the image on the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right, yeah, we care. What what degree? To what degree do you think that uh, uh, whatever country that's a part of, or other countries, uh, uh, would marshal resources to do something about that problem? Right. I mean, so I'll answer my own question. I mean, they won't. We wouldn't. And in fact, if the entire planet was dominated by that, that is to say, there were no people everything would be great. <laughs> Ecosystems would thrive and, 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 and critters, as it says down there, and I apologize, but that last little bit is a little bit of an inside joke with a few people here who were giggling. Um, critters, wildlife, fish, the land, the water, the resources, the environment would probably do okay, right? So I'm not advocating to have no people, don't get me wrong, but the image on the right is a whole different story and it's why we're all here. Right? I mean, this is related to disasters, but disasters are driven and exacerbated by climate change. And so these are a lot of the things that we're talking about. And, and so word number one is people, and I think it's just largely and significantly about people. And then I assume I do that way. And then just emphasizing that, and someone actually said at least part of this, and this is couched in terms, um, I guess in some ways of our Sea Grant College program, of course, because we do research, education, and outreach, and many programs do, and many organizations are involved in at least one, if not all, of these things. And it really is all about those human resources and those which are our long-term assets. This is what it's all about and why we're all doing these things. Um, the next word I'd offer to you is motivation. And um, how many people here have been to the beach bar and grill? Raise of hands, yeah? A lot of people who live here, I'm sure. I, I got to go there last night. Austin was mad at me because I left early. But I had the opportunity to go there and spend some time with a group of folks that I don't often get to spend time with. We had a lot of good conversation. So um, what do you think is the motivation of a bartender at the Beach Bar and Grill? Why is the bartender there? Anyone, shout it out. Money, hey, they're there to make money. Why am I there? Don't answer it, I'll give you this. That's why I'm there. That's my motivation. The beer and the burger and all of that. Now, while we, we're motivated in, do, in different, completely different ways, I would offer, we, we're both really happy with the transaction, right? And we both really uh, find this common endpoint that we're happy with. And so the point of motivation is one of the key words that I walk away with is that not all our organizations, not all, um, uh, you know, whether you were talking about uh, government organizations, nonprofit, or we don't all need to have the same motivation to come to the same endpoint and to work together to agree to that same endpoint. And we shouldn't spend too much try time trying to change motivation, but rather find pathways in which we can get to that same endpoint by utilizing and recognizing and understanding the motivation of others. Um, skip the slide, but interconnectivity is the third, and um, we're interconnected. We're, we're connected to our past. We have to learn more from our past. We work hard. We heard a lot about that here in Guam. We work um, in that realm, if you will, in Hawaii and across the Pacific and Pacific Islands. And, and our watersheds are interconnected uh, from the top of the mountain to the ocean, and if we try to approach any of these problems and we forget about that interconnectivity, I think we're, we're really missing the mark. We're gonna leave out some really big pieces and we're not gonna have the success that we, we hope to have and that we're looking for. And of course, and this has been mentioned over and over and I'm speak, talking to the choir here, but um, that big, all that blue stuff interconnects each and every one of us and every single person on the planet and, and we need to keep all of that in mind as we 
as we draw from all these examples and all the lessons learned and the science that we do and all those things. And then last, um, implementation. And I can't speak to this as well here in Guam, but I certainly can in Hawaii. I know in Hawaii we do, I mean, we plan to plan, and then we plan to plan to plan, and then we execute plans, and then we make more plans. And no offense to the planners in the room here in Guam, across the Pacific, planning is essential. The plans, eh, not so much. We need to implement them, right? It's the act of planning, it's the getting together, it's all the work that goes into that planning and understanding that is so much more important than the plan that gets published and put on the shelf. Yes, we can use things in those plans, but let's do that. Let's focus on the implementation. And I, I, we're having these conversations in Hawaii in a big way. Brad is over there kind of smirking at me because he knows. And, you know, we've been talking about this, like, you know, in Waikiki, which hotel will be the first one to raise their hand, volunteer, and move back? Yeah, right. So we need to implement. We need to implement something. We can continue to plan. We should and must continue to plan. But we really have to just start moving forward. We have enough science on a number of things, a lot of things, where we just need to make those decisions, move it, and do it. And you know what? Not, not be afraid to maybe make a mistake in doing that and then be able to look at that mistake and say, OK, I get that now. Let's make a change. Again, I just come back to where I started and say, I don't think I said anything in these four slides and with these four words that all of you and everybody else who was here earlier and has been participating has been saying, um, but it's really emphasized a lot of these things for me and certainly given me the, kind of empowered me to go back home and bring it to our folks. So thank you very much. Thank you for doing that PowerPoint. You did give it to me on the smallest flash drive possible. I was hoping it would get lost on its way upstairs, but it, it got there. So <laughs> powerful words. Thank you. Ms. Marathi. I, I return to, to the term living laboratory. And I keep coming back to that insofar as what our role and what our place is in this place. And I am hopeful that uh, I have learned something from every single session that I've attended. And the planning and the implementation will be very critical. But I think taking that energy and sharing that energy, um, what Sefa said last night, um, at least share with three. If we can share with more, that would be even better. But um, the energy that's been generated um, needs to be sustained and grown. Um, and so uh, I am hopeful and I call on all of you uh, to join us um, as we go through this journey. Uh, it's not going to be the simplest of journeys. Um, but I will say this, that even in the planning of the journey, um, many of us will learn much. So thank you, Austin. Do we have any questions um, from the audience or some of your um, final thoughts for, uh, for this week? Please raise your hand and we'll, um, I think we have the microphones and they'll be brought to you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here, coming to Guam and sharing your insights. Um, my name is Maria McDonald, um, a school librarian, and um, I came here to get one credit. But um, <laughs> I have like loads and loads of information here. I don't even know what I'm going to write down for the one credit. But my, my <laughs> what I wanted to, to tell you was that um, I feel uh, very good. I feel excited. And I feel that what I'm doing is what I've been wanting to do all my life. And I'm an older woman, as you can see. But what I've learned is that in our planning stage, we need to think of three things. Our ancestry, the R, A-R-E, our relationship, and our environment. And that's very hard. And we go through that through our life. And then when we gain a little more wisdom, we can, as you are doing, stand up there and say, where do we go from here? And while the young ones are still kind of 
fishing around with the ARE, you have your PI, which is, well, it's got to be personal or my identity. And then it becomes easier. And so I just wanted to, to share that with you and everybody else, is that that's exactly what I'm doing right now. And um, I'm from Guam. I have a six, seven acre sustainable farm in Agate. I spent 15 years of my life doing this and um, I learned a lot. I've done a lot of this stuff and um, I think it's time for us now to start from the very beginning with our children. And uh, as a librarian in an elementary school, I think it's important to identify the skills and then right after that, the practice. And usually in early literacy, there's five. <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that. And we all know that's, that's coming from an educator. Thank you. Dr. Maggie, you had a response? Well, sort of a response, but what I want, because that's how we would feel about about all of this, but Jackie asked us in the beginning uh, to bring in about businesses and companies and that sort of thing. And um, also, it was talked about in terms of motivation. In business, you don't talk about so much, of, you do talk, uh, the word is a value proposition. And so uh, it's very important for, if you want to do this kind of thing, to, to learn a few business terms. And what I found out was stem boomerang that was fascinating to me. So I knew the value proposition of the, the young professionals who wanted to come home, and I knew the value proposition of the companies who needed people to hire who would be stable and stay. I ended up working with a marketing person for whom the value proposition was all the company I was, companies I was bringing together. And people who, and actually the people who have stayed with me are real estate developers who realize the, realize the value proposition of all these young people coming together. So what I'm saying is that when you think about doing something, changing behaviors, uh, making a, a difference, that it's very important that you really go someplace quiet. And, and think about this from all sorts of directions because you never know where your help is going to come from. It depends on what the value propositions are that you can see in what you're doing. And so I think that's the, that is the beauty when you mention all the different groups that are here, uh, is that it's clear that they see the value propositions. There may be even more, you, you, it could show up that sometimes there's magic in an event like this. Thank you. Any other uh, comments, questions from the audience? Ms. Thomas Nettedog. Uh, half a day, and thank you, presenters and panelists, and the good work that Austin, you and Jackie have done for this uh, awesome conference. I'm glad we're closing with looking at the sustainable development goals. I did mention it yesterday in our breakout session as well. And I'm particularly um, focused on uh, SDG 17, which is the partnerships. I am uh, currently the chair for the Pacific Islands Association of Non-Governmental Organizations, and we're based in Suva, Fiji. So all the nonprofit leaders from throughout the Pacific have this organization where we meet on a regular basis to talk about community-based activities, and we're very much focused on Agenda 2030. It's been kind of like our, our marching order, so to speak. So I haven't heard too much about the engagement and the interaction uh, with community-based organizations, NGOs, and uh, we've had the most awesome presenters from academia and even from government, which has been great. How do you see the intersect with the NGOs? Of course, we have a wide variety of NGOs. I mean, just the session that we had uh, yesterday, we had organizations like GAIN, and we had organizations that were just very diverse. So I understand that. But given that, how can we interface uh, with the NGOs much better? 
First of all, I wanted to say congratulations on holding such an important position. Piango has done amazing work throughout the region, so thank you for your role in continuing to steward all of those fantastic uh, not-for-profits. SDG 17 is, I think, what really has differentiated the SDGs from the MDGs, even though there was a focus on partnerships for the goals with the MDGs. The idea that SDG 17 is, in fact, um, the glue that binds, given that the other 16 SDGs are very much intertwined. So it's almost impossible to achieve any one of them without a meaningful coalition. And to give the example of Hawaii Green Growth, many of the members are heads of not-for-profits. So we have Conservation International, we have the Nature Conservancy, and then a range of only Hawaii-based NGOs who are doing work at the grassroots level. Sorry for my voice. But I couldn't agree more that it is so important to have representation from all parts of society. And that's really the strength that I've seen in the conference over the past few days, that there is a genuine uh, coming together of a very powerful coalition. And certainly, I think that the ongoing role of not-for-profits in terms of the expertise that's brought, but also the deep community engagement is absolutely critical. So thank you for the point and for your role. Thanks. Thank you, um, Amanda, and thank you for the question. Um, Sarah, I, I think, and, and you know me, we have been working together on, on a number of profits, and I think nonprofits, and, and I think shared values, aligned values, are a really important um, aspect of how business can be a part and it can contribute to the growth of nonprofits. Uh, we have partnered in numerous um, initiatives, we have provided um, volunteers insofar as, as, as working with the nonprofits, board members, um, financing as needed. Uh, and I think that alignment of values is really important and continues to grow. It's very strong in the islands. Um, and we're, I think we're very proud of that because our, our companies, uh, particularly our locally based companies, um, step up in a way that not many other organizations um, uh, do. So we're very proud of that. Um, and we continue to, to work and partner with, with you all. Um, uh, and so, uh, again, aligned values in terms of what you offer to the community and how that aligns with our, um, our goals as well is really important. Um, another uh, comment or question, uh, President Elsa. Good afternoon. Um, I believe that uh, sustainable, sustainable development is a very challenging journey. Uh, while we want uh, very, very uh, expanded or disseminated uh, advocacy on this, I believe that this journey can begin with a single step, and that should begin in ourselves. You should walk the talk. If we really believe in sustainability, sustainable development, then we should start from within, from ourselves. Because if you don't do it, how can we influence others to believe in it? So okay, we need to uh, practice that uh, as much as possible. Don't drink water anymore from bottled waters. Refrain from using straws from plastic bags. If you can do that, we can. Uh, others can see what we're doing, and we can influence them to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May I add something to that? Such a powerful point, and I think it really reinforces what Jackie said about the role of business and aligned values. As consumers, we have enormous purchasing power. And those of us who are women, we control 85% of global purchasing power. We make 70% of the financial decisions and business partnerships. We, particularly as women, are purchasing powerhouses. So if we make choices, to spend our money with those companies who have sustainable values and who actually demonstrate a commitment to the sustainable development goals in practice, not just in theory, that can really help shift things. So I, I love your point. It's about being aligned and not just, as you said, talk is cheap, actually taking action 
so that businesses who are doing the right thing are rewarded. Can I just follow on that, Charlton? So you've already achieved SDG 5. You've just enunciated how powerful women are. Again, I'm not sure what your legislature is like, but I walked in and I saw eight persons on screen and predominantly women. They were strong, they were focused, they were passionate, and that's how you get the job done. So you're already ticking boxes. I, I can't resist. SDG 5 is um, near and dear to my heart. And as I mentioned this morning, two of the top 10 solutions to climate change are girls' education and family planning. It is a disgrace that in 2019, there are only six countries that have a gender equitable legislative framework. So I would love to see more legislatures in the US look like Guam, which has 75% women, I think. The average in the US is 23%, which is below global averages. And so I think that we need more male champions like you guys, but we certainly still have a very long way to go on SDG 5, unfortunately. Thank you. We have uh, time for one more question or comment, and then we're going to get to those three exciting announcements. Don't want to delay it? Okay, okay, good. <laughs> okay, announcement number one. Master Navigator Larry Regotel has uh, informed me that he will come back um, to the island to do another special course for us. So thank you, Dr. Shelton. This was decided one minute before I walk up here. Uh, no, but I, I guess before I announce that, I think I should at least uh, make some statement as a prelude and, and also of qualification. Uh, as you know, and I spoke about this earlier, uh, or yesterday, uh, navigation is one of those sacred knowledge um, as such, it was meant to be passed within that realm, uh, not to be outside. Um, when instances like that happen, there's exceptions. And navigation is not a standalone knowledge by itself. It involves all other sacred knowledge, be it healing, uh, weather uh, prediction, or uh, canoe carving, so all of this is is all sacred knowledge that uh, that at the pinnacle of it might be the navigation skill. Um, and then you get the, some people uh, think that because I went through the initiation process and, and became a pole navigator, that I am a great navigator. Please understand, of all the initiated pole navigators that I know of in my part of the world, I'm probably the last on the list in as far as being a master navigator. They are more knowledgeable than I am. And I give all the credit to them. It is for them that I come and do these things. Um, that said, you know, you, you must understand that Poe is really just the beginning of the whole lifelong learning. So I tell the students, I am also a student with them. And together we learn. Uh, even though what I've gone through for the past many years of my life, I've learned and become initiated. I'm voyaging. Uh, I am like them in that sense. So uh, Austin and I have agreed that we're looking at perhaps the uh, spring semester, is it? Yeah, so sometime around January that should give time for interested participants uh, to to sign up, uh, registered at the university, and uh, let's learn together. Thank you. So this will likely be another uh, short-term special course, but we're going to increase from six weeks to eight weeks now, and it will start at the beginning of the Fanyum Knock in the spring 2020 semester, so it uh, aligns with the, the timing of the semester, so I think we'll have uh, quite a few more students able to take it. So please tell your friends about that uh, and, and plan for that for um, the beginning of next year. Okay, announcement number two. Uh, did everybody enjoy the seed talks last night? Yes? <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, our, our Sea Grant um, uh, turtle biologist, uh, Josefa Munoz, did an excellent job last night. We're really proud of her. And tomorrow, I hope, that, I, th I hope that a lot of you have signed up for the Cocos Island tour so that she can show you what she's doing over there um, with the turtle nests and uh, the turtle tracks. It'll be an exciting um, trip. Uh, but uh, you know, we're, we're really happy to have Sefa in the office, and we've been talking about what she's going to do next. She's had a uh, bachelor's of science from, uh, from UOG, and uh, we just got an announcement that she's um, received... <laughs> Even I'm going to cry. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> So she is going to be the second student uh, at UOG to get an NSF um, Graduate Research Fellowship Award. I don't have the award here in my hand, but I don't know. We'll take a picture with it and shake everybody's hand up here. Yeah, so thousands of students apply for this every year, and uh, this is only the second time at, that we know of at the University of Guam where our student has gotten one of these, so we're really proud of her. And uh, Sefa, you want to tell us all um, what your research project is going to be on? So I was telling her, I was really hoping that, uh, you know, if it would be really great if we can announce this, if we find out if you're getting the, the award uh, during the conference, because we knew it was going to come in April. And you know what? She got the email just this afternoon that she was awarded. Uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm probably going to be a little bit of a mess here, but... Um, that was hard work. <laughs> um, I put my heart into it, and you know they accepted my heart. <laughs> um, but I'm very excited for um, you know all of the research, especially you know for sea turtles um, that will come in the future. Hopefully, you know I can do great things here on Guam for our Hagen um, and learn more and more about them, so we can preserve this uh, cultural icon here on our island. <laughs> Anything else? I, I forgot. Oh, my research. Oh, so my, pro <laughs> my proposed project was, um, so we don't know too much about our turtles here on Guam. So I wanted to establish, um, I wanted to, oh, right. Okay, some of you guys were there. So we know that the feminization of the sea turtle population has already begun, right? So I wanted to determine what mating strategies are they using out there? Um, so are males uh, mating with many females or are females, wait, is one male mating with many females or is one female mating with many males? You know, what are they doing to um, combat that strategy of, um, you know, having that high uh, female sex ratio, right? What are they doing? Um, and then also determine uh, paternity. Yeah, that, that, man, guys, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, and then also um, establish the baseline sex ratio. So how many males are out there and how many females are out there? All of the parent turtles, basically, and through genetics and all the fancy stuff. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's my project. So thank you everyone for your support who helped me through it and you know, helped me through the stress. Uh, thank you. <laughs> oh. Well, you're just getting started now and I'm really happy that um, you know, we have, uh, we're going to have a pipeline, so um, perhaps she can come back and be Sea Grant Director and, and work at, at, uh, at UOG. We're really excited for Sefa. And also, we just had uh, Lauren Swadell, our master's student who graduated from last year. Now she's in, uh, in Washington, D.C., doing a, a year-long fellowship with uh, the Canals Policy Fellows. So we're really happy of our, for our students here at the Center for Island Sustainability and Sea Grant, and uh, we're proud that they're going through this pipeline. Uh, and we're going to do everything we, we can with Maggie's model of that boomerang and make sure they come back home.
Okay, and for the third and final announcement, for the very first time at our, in, in these 10 years, we're finally planning a little bit more ahead, and we have come up with the dates for the 2020 conference. So you can mark it in your calendars now, and uh, we're locking it in, okay? Do we have that slide? Right here. March 30th through April 3rd, 2020, here at the Hyatt. It's just been booked today. I told Larry 15 minutes he would be on the panel. I think at minute 14 I saw the Hyatt, and this was confirmed, and so we're all good to go.